In 2020, did you know that Kenya was ranked at position 56 out of 190 countries in the ease of doing business report by the World Bank? The ranking was a surprise to many, including myself and other Kenyans. As a matter of fact, it is said that Kenya had moved up five positions over about um, five years. But does that really reflect the reality on the ground? The report looks at how easy it is to start a business in terms of the procedures, the time, and the costs related to licenses required to start a business, getting a construction permit, electricity connection, taxation, and many other indicators. However, that victory was short-lived because the World Bank withdrew the rankings after they discovered that countries found a way to influence the results so that they can get a better ranking. Though they didn't really say which countries were involved in influencing their rankings. As expected, this government used this report to blow its own trumpet, even though the reality on the ground is different. Starting a business in this country is the easy part, but running it and making sure that it's a profitable and sustainable business is a different ball game altogether. We're looking at the second way that the government is sabotaging and destroying the business environment in Kenya. Welcome to Wanjiko's Eye. Hi, welcome to this channel. My name is Susan Wanjiko and I'm the founder of Wanjiko's Eye. And here I give political education to demonstrate the relationship between economic development and governance so that you can understand, engage, and influence the matters that affect you and I. Now, I've had many economists and politicians commenting on the state of affairs in the country, with some saying that we should focus on the economics of the country and not the politics of the country. And I've also had other comments that are closely related, like Kenya doesn't have political problems, but instead it has economic problems. But if you've been following my videos, I'm sure that it's becoming very clear that you cannot separate the economics of a country from the politics of a country. So in this video, we'll look at political decisions and the economic implications of such decisions. And I'll be using six scenarios to demonstrate the business environment in Kenya and what the relevance of good politics is with regard to all this. And I'll finish off by explaining what that means for you. Now, if you have experience running a business in Kenya or if you've been exposed to what it might be like, especially if you've worked for a small enterprise, you know it's not easy fit. But for the sake of the people who are new to this, I'll begin with some definitions. So first, let's understand laws and regulations. Now, before you do business in any country in the world, whether as a local or an international investor, there are certain rules that you must follow in that particular country. And these rules are in the form of laws and regulations. And they address both economic and social issues. And in addition to that, they can be a reflection of what a country considers moral or immoral. Uh, for example, Kenyans on Twitter branded Ezekiel Mutua as Deputy G Jesus because of being forever in collision with the Gangeton artists because their music was quite explicit, especially their videos, and I think he banned some of their songs. So that's an example of regulation on the media industry. The implication is if you can't comply, just look for alternative content or don't produce at all because your efforts will be wasted if your music is banned in the country. There was also a time um, in the early 2000s when the, there were many incidences of people dying from road accidents. Um, it was becoming too frequent, so the then Transport Minister John Mishuki made it mandatory for all public service vehicles to have seat belts installed. And they were also not allowed to carry passenger, passengers beyond the capacity of the Matatu, or else they would end up paying heavy fines. And it was met with resistance, obviously, because it became an added cost to the matatu industry. But at the end of the day, it was beneficial because it protected people's lives when they were traveling uh, in a matatu. 
plus they tamed the reckless matter to culture to an extent. So that's an example of law or regulation that for as long as you're operating a public service vehicle, you have to have seat belts, otherwise you'll be fined or your operating license will be revoked or you have to keep bribing the law enforcement, that's the police, so that you can keep your license. And those are just a few examples. So these laws and regulations are there to achieve certain objectives, such as protecting you and I from, as consumers from being exploited, like in terms of being overcharged or from harmful products. And they also protect the businesses of the locals in a country, like preventing cheap imports from flooding the country or di dictating the terms of doing business for international investors in Kenya. Like how KFC is a multinational operating in Kenya and they don't source potatoes from Kenya. So such things are a matter of trade laws and regulations. And in addition to that, they control what comes into the country and what leaves. And finally, they also prevent an ethical business practice in Kenya or be uh, behavior that discourages competition and many other reasons. Nonetheless, it's important to note that at face value, the motive of a regulation can seem like it's in the interest of you and I. But sometimes when you investigate further, you realize that a regulation or law was put in place to favor some private interests like a politician, his friends, his family, or just anyone close to these lawmakers. So the expectation is that they make the laws with the interests of you and I in mind. But the reality is that that isn't always the case. And that's why in democratic countries, including Kenya, insist that laws and regulations be made openly and transparently and with public participation to ensure that the parties that will be affected have been consulted on matters. I'll remind you that politics involves controlling the information that you and I have. So what are some of the tools used to regulate an industry? Now, there are many tools to regulate an industry, including introducing a minimum standard, either of a product or a production process. And there are also different types of taxes, trade agreements, bureaucratic procedures, putting fees and licenses, and many others. At the end of the day, whichever tool is used depends on what the government is trying to achieve. Uh, if this was an economics class, I would have given you the ideal picture, but here we are being realistic and analytical. So we'll see how these tools are used, where they're used, and what that means for the economy. Now, in Kenya, taxation is one of those things that has really been abused and misused in this country in the name of mobilizing resources or development purposes. But that's far from the truth. So the first thing is overtaxation to compensate for bad behavior. Road development levy, railway levy, 16% VAT on fuel, 20% excise duty on loans, digital tax, increase in tax in airtime. And you see the things is they don't tax things that you don't use. In fact, they tax what you can't avoid. For instance, that one increase in the tax in fuel doesn't mean that it only applies to people with cars. It means that anything that uses fuel in Kenya will become more expensive. That's your food becomes more expensive, your electricity bill, your transport fare, your cooking oil, and almost literally everything else you consume because they transport. That's why living in Kenya has become so expensive over such a short period of time. Um, I think from around 2017 to now. And that's called cost push inflation. And it's so dangerous to an economy, especially when people's salary isn't increasing. Now, remember my discussion on disposable income. Each time you have to pay more for something because taxes have made it more expensive, then that means you have less money to spend. Uh, just think about it. What do you do when life is expensive and you're still earning the same amount? Either you stop consuming something completely because you can't afford it, or you buy less of something than you used to, or you drop some things and just stick to necessities like rent, food, or save for a rainy day like an unexpected hospital bill. So guys, let me remind you, Kenya is not a rich country. And when you go broke, that means a business somewhere is losing a customer. Remember, an economy is where people are making similar interdependent decisions and are in similar circumstances. 
say many people are broke uh, in Kenya, that means many people do not have business in Kenya. And that's the situation right now. It's important that you understand that we're in this situation of overtaxation because of the national debt uh, piling up. So we need to pay for that. And we also need to compensate for the money that is being stolen daily. The second thing is that Kenya has a very unpredictable tax environment. So it's not only high tax, but it's also unpredictable. Like you can wake up one morning and find that a political decision was made somewhere to introduce a new range of taxes. For example, in 2020, I just started my business when the government tried to introduce a tax called minimum tax. And it was supposed to be a 1% tax on sales, regardless of whether you've made a profit or loss. Guys, let me tell you the stress I had for a new business every shilling count. And I was only able to afford rent by the grace of God. So imagine now if your business has not even started making profit and now you become short on cash because of a tax. So imagine if you're in a situation or you wanted to start a business, would you still want to start it knowing that you'd have to pay a tax even if you made a loss? So think about it. So such things create an environment that discourages entrepreneurship and innovation and business. If you're going to destroy an economy in the name of funding development projects, that's voodoo economics. It's unheard of. So listen to what our president had to say about it when someone asked him to review the taxes. <laughs> Ya dadangu ambaye amesimama hapa nimefurahi sana na statement yake na speech yake lakini kule ndani ananiambia atipunguza ushuru ala hiyo siwezi kupunguza hiyo ushuru mtalipa wenzangu kwa sababu hakuna njia ingine tunaweza kujenga facilities kama hii hakuna njia ingine tutajenga mabarabara hakuna njia ingine tutajenga mashule well we're on the same issue on taxes it's evident that Kenya is in a dire situation and we need the money badly, both for administrative purposes and for development purposes. So let's look at an instance where the government does things which are unfair and in conflict with its own objectives. Um, remember right now, the government has just one mission, which is to collect taxes, like Uhuru said. And at around the same time in 2021, but a few months before Uhuru's statement, the members of parliament approved to exempt Japanese companies, consultants and employees from paying taxes in Kenya for projects that are funded by the Japanese government, the Japan government. It's a policy that the Japanese government usually have um, if they fund and implement your project. So the cabinet secretary of the treasury, Ukuri Atani, defended the proposal to the MPs by stating that, and I quote, the benefits to be derived from effective implementation of the projects outweigh the tax for gone, and the income from the jobs created from the projects and the income derived from the expenditure will generate revenue that is far above the tax for gone. It sounds valid, right? However, given the reality of the Kenyan context, Contracts are embarrassingly overpriced, there are kickbacks involved, and not to mention how some projects become useless after they are completed. On top of that, the government gives validity to all these allegations by doing one thing, refusing to be transparent and making these contracts public. Nonetheless, despite the justification by the cabinet secretary, the MPs raised very valid concerns before making their approval. For starters, business owned by Kenyans don't get such tax exemptions, not in Kenya and not in Japan. So that's discrimination against Kenyan businesses. And secondly, like I said, because of corruption, government contracts are shady and have underhand dealings. So the MPs told the Treasury that they want to see all the arguments uh, when they were signed, what the projects seek to achieve, uh, the duration for the project, and the percentage of the loans and grants. Guys, don't be deceived. You don't need to be an economist. Just use logic. So explain to me like a child, where is the logic in exempting the Japanese from taxes amounting to the billions only to chase and harass 
small Kenyan businesses for the same taxes. So the third thing is KRA being used as a weapon. So the Kenya Revenue Authority, KRA, is used to uh, harass people in business. Ideally, if KRA slaps you with a tax bill that you don't agree with, you have a right to appeal. And let's get this. Most governments will want you to pay taxes, but individuals and businesses want to pay less taxes, it's obvious. And because of that, they have to come to an, an understanding because both of them depend on each other. So first, there are ways to, amicable ways to resolve tax conflicts in Kenya, like you can go through a tax tribunal or to the courts for such matters. And second, the government can't employ everyone so in a tough and hostile business environment like Kenya, when there's already high unemployment and poverty, shutting down businesses which employ people is a classic example of kicking someone when they're already down and biting the hand that feeds you. So some of the big players that have fallen victim to KRAs like Africa Spirits Limited, Kerecha Breweries, Mount Kenya Breweries, and to name a few. So thankfully, our justice system has really tried to maintain some sanity in the business environment. For example, Judge Wildon Korir in 2021 made a ruling where KRA had been sued for shutting down a company over tax evasion claims. In his judgment, and I quote, he said, when the Kenya Revenue Authority proceeds to kill businesses in the guise of collecting taxes, it becomes an undertaker and will itself eventually die since its survival depends on the existence of income generating businesses from which it can collect. In short, how are you killing the businesses yet they pay taxes um, and that's what pays you. So another way that regulation is abused is frustrating small traders in the name of quality. For example, in 2018, Business owners who import goods from China and sell them in Yamakema had their goods confiscated at government warehouses in Embakasi. In the name of goods are contraband and counterfeit, and I think at some point they even banned them. I've put the story in the link, you can read it for yourself. But without getting into much detail, their goods were confiscated for a certain period and they accumulated charges while being held, uh, and they were expensive. So after a certain point, the traders were not able to pay that holding fee, their goods were auctioned back into the market. So what I found ironic about this entire story is where the goods were auctioned back into the market. Again, let's use logic to look at these issues combined. First, the government had known for a while what these businesses uh, were trading in because these were not first-time businesses, they were seasoned businessmen that they had been doing it for a while. Secondly, when you import something into the country, you have to declare, so it's not really a surprise. Um, and third, without deliberating on issues of quality. If at all they were counterfeit and contraband and substandard, why were they being auctioned and reavailed back into the market? Does that make sense? Also, part of the justification for this ban was that the government wanted to reduce imports from China, but truth be told, did the Chinese import reduce after this crackdown? Not really. In fact, the range of imports increased, but this time, the Chinese are the ones bringing the imports and no longer Kenyans. So they killed Kenyan businesses so that the Chinese ones could thrive. I know someone will try and be the devil's advocate saying that they wanted to reduce the imports for the sake of protecting local manufacturers. But guys, Kenya isn't even there yet to start making such considerations because we've barely given um, manufacturing an opportunity to thrive in this country. So that's, that's overstepping. Tibia Sharetu may affect you on China. Kwakua, Ameleta, Zile Zile Vitu Tukonazo, cheaper than us. Tunanunua kwa, alafu anatufuata mpaka Kenya. Anakuja na hizo hizo exactly what we are selling, anauza cheaper. Kutoka mchaina akuja hapa, unagojia mchaina amaliza vitu zake, diweze kuuza. Na kama sasa, kumekuwa na shida pot. So unaona vitu za mchaina zinakuja kila wakati, vitu zaku zimekwama pot, zimekwama kwa duka, hata runs wezi ripa. 
So finally, there are times when someone is interested in an industry and they use laws and regulations to kill one business so that another takes over. And that's the tragic story of Spot Pesa. Spot Pesa was accused of all manner of things, including tax evasion, encouraging betting, and being used as a conduit for money laundering. But I'll stick to the first two. And long story short, KRA slapped them with a tax bill, they appealed through a tribunal, and they won the case against KRA. In addition to that, to discourage people from betting, they increased the tax on what you win from 10% to 20%. So this made the big players Bettin and Sport Pesa leave the market. Guys, again, allow logic to come in. Did Bettin reduce or stop after Sport Pesa left? No. Many, there are many other ways of betting. But what I found interesting about the entire story is that despite not being found guilty for tax evasion and instead actually winning awards from KRA and not being charged for money laundering, um, while other taxes were being increased in 2021, the excise duty on betting uh, was reduced from 20% to 7.5%. And obviously now that encourages more people to bet. And now after the tragic fall of Spot Pesa, someone took over the industry almost shortly after. And another thing I found intriguing is that after the taxes on what you win were reduced and Spot Pesa tried to get back into the Kenyan market, they were no longer allowed to use the trading name of Spot Pesa. Now, guys, I was in marketing before this, and let me tell you, a name is everything to a business or a brand that is established. For example, if Tasca renamed itself to Pombe, like without informing the public that it has rebranded and changed its name from Tasca to Pombe, would you still buy that beer? You'd think it's something totally different. And that's exactly what is happening here. So where does good politics come in? I mentioned that good politics involves doing everything you can to make sure you keep your power, even if it includes voting for something that has horrible repercussions. Without even being an economist, it was clear to everyone that an increase in fuel prices will hurt everyone in Kenya, especially the most vulnerable citizens, that if the tax is put on fuel. And that's why this debate was so contentious in Parliament. And it was mostly Jubilee or people allied to Jubilee versus the rest. Have a look at this.
So the party voted for, or is it that you represent the party instead of the people of Alego Songa? That's a yeah, question. Yeah. And, and very many people are asking yeah, the and, same and, question. And, and, and this is, we are, we are an example of other um, developed democracies. Mm -hmm. These are on issues of policy, on issues of taxation. This taxation is a policy issue that nobody, no member of parliament should pretend to me that he can take his own position. If you go to any democracy, these are issues that political parties must take a position on. And I am happy that I, have to, I, I, I took the position of my I party. Am mm -hmm. Yes, because, you know, that which, which, which democracy are we comparing ourselves with? The political, I, I party, the political party must have a, a position on taxation, on all these things, you know. Let me oh. tell you, yes. the Mule, you know, he does, I think Honorable Atandi doesn't speak for me, that you don't have a brain because it was taken by your party leadership. Mm -hmm. You know, you can make up your choice. Because if we were just following the party position, and that's what I was telling my mm -hmm. colleagues, mm -hmm. then we would not have even amended the finance bill. We would have mm -hmm. passed it the way it came from the executive because mm -hmm. it was the property of the government. Mm -hmm. We would not have touched it because anyway, it came from our government. Mm -hmm. So we would have let it go the way it was. But we amended unanimously in that house, and that is why we are here. We unanimously postponed the 16% to 2020, mm -hmm. unanimously from either side. Mm -hmm. So in terms of party, and if I remember, you know, even on Raila Odinga was one of the first people to comment in public that don't worry, when uh, the president comes back, he will deal with this thing mm -hmm. and it will be over. They later had their motions and they were convinced otherwise. But I can tell you, they did not convince even a quarter of their leadership mm -hmm. and even a quarter of their membership in that house because the majority were actually taking a position from an informed point of view that these taxes will hurt Kenyans and we represent them mm -hmm. as the representatives of the people. We cannot mm -hmm. put yeah you know earplugs even if we like and it's not that we don't respect our leadership but sometimes a wrong is just a wrong and okay. we can take a position honorable kira this is yeah. a face tapi nimeshidwa nitafanya nini jua kipadisha mafuta ni kutumisa kabisa Na ni kila mtu hata ule ya kwa ofisi juu anatoka kwa na gari. Hata ule ya kwa karibu anatuumisa na kuendea hii mizigo. So, hatujui kama tutaeza hii biyashara. So what does this mean for you? Guys, remember economics is the decisions that you make. What influences those de decisions? What is the thought process behind those decisions? Who do your decisions affect and how does it affect them? So laws and regulations either encourage you to do something or discourage you from it. Ultimately, for as long as Kenya has a hostile business environment to its own people, employment and poverty will continue to be an issue and Kenya will continue being a very expensive place to live in. People will not be willing to take the risk to start and grow their businesses and investors will not be willing to invest in Kenyan businesses. Watch out for my next video where I discuss how KPLC, that's the Kenya Power and Lighting Company, a parastatal in Kenya, how KPLC is sabotaging the economy of Kenya. If you found this video to be useful, make sure to leave a comment down below. And if, you, if you've had your fair share of running a business in Kenya, please let us know what your experience has been, especially if it was challenging. Like and share this video so that we can build a community of people who understand, engage, and influence the matters that affect you and I. Also, don't forget to subscribe. If you'd like to read more on what I've discussed, I've attached all the references in the description box. So make sure you check that out so that you can understand uh, the context of all these issues. As always, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.